Hello and welcome to Ogma YC Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church and it's great that you can join me as we continue reading the book of Numbers during the month of September. Before we dive in, we ought to pray, so please would you pray with me. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you would speak to us through it even now. We humble ourselves before you. And we sit at your feet, Lord Jesus, wanting to learn. Show us who we are and show us your great salvation. Please give us your spirit and a heart for understanding and full of faith. We ask in your great name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right. Numbers chapter 5 verse 1. Of course, the one who is speaking to Moses here, the Lord, the I am, is the Lord Jesus himself. He spoke to Moses as a man speaks with his friend. This is the visible Lord who makes the invisible Lord known, the eternal word of God, the eternal son of God. It's Jesus. And we might find it a bit strange as we read the opening verses here because it's not what we expect Jesus to say because of what later happens in the Gospels. But let's read it. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or a discharge of any kind, or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away male and female alike. Send them outside the camp so they will not defile the camp, their camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did so. They sent them outside the camp. They did just as the Lord had instructed Moses. It must have been quite a life being so near and yet so far to be part of God's people and yet cast outside the camp. And it's for our benefit that we would learn what sin is like, the nature of it. It defiles and it separates us from our Lord and our God. Much more could be said on that. And like I say, the Gospels give a beautiful contrast to this teaching here. Showing the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done. Let's keep reading for now though. Verse 5. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any man or woman... Who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty. That's interesting, isn't it? By wronging other people, ultimately we are sinning against God. And you can read Psalm 51 about how David knew this. And it's true for all of us and for all of sin. All of sin is ultimately an offence and a rebellion against the living God Not to say that there can be some awful collateral damage and great hurt is not to minimise the pain inflicted on others, but it is to maximise the offence that causes the one in whom the person is made in the image of. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So, a man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person they have wronged. But if that person has no close relative to whom restitution can be made for the wrong, the restitution belongs to the Lord and must be given to the priest, along with the ram with which atonement is made for the wrongdoer. All the sacred contributions to the Israelites bring to a priest. All the sacred contributions the Israelites bring to a priest will belong to him. Sacred things belong to their owners, but what they give to the priest will belong to the priest. Let me take us to Luke 19 where we see the famous tax collector Zacchaeus. Jesus, who is the Lord, entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So 
he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. See, the law says this is the baseline. If you wrong someone, you've got to add a fifth to what was taken or ruined or whatever. Add a fifth to it. That's the baseline. That's what the law demands. That is what is just and fair. But what happens when someone receives the gift of God? They don't want to do just what is right. They don't want to drop to the baseline and scrape by. They are overwhelmed with the generosity and grace of the living God. And so they want to show that to others and let it spread through their whole lives, just as Zacchaeus did. He didn't add a fifth. He did four times the amount if he wronged anyone. And then he gave half his possessions away. He just gave it all away. And reading between the lines is because he realises Jesus gave it all away for him. Today salvation has come to this house. May the good news of Jesus, may he have such an impact in our lives. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, so that another man has sexual relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected, since there is no witness against her, and she has not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband, and he suspects his wife, and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest, he must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, If no other man has had sexual relations with you, and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen. So be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink the water that brings a curse and this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before the Lord and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. 
When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her, her abdomen will swell, and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure but is clean, she'll be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. This, then, is the law of jealousy. When a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her husband, or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he suspects his wife. The priest is to have her stand before the Lord and is to apply this entire law to her. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. This really is an uncomfortable passage, isn't it? And I don't have all the answers, but one thing that I will say is that Today, in our culture, we often think the one who is jealous is in the wrong. We just want to live our life. We just want to be fulfilled in every aspect. That's our right, isn't it? Sexually and in every other way. But there is serious pain when Husbands and wives are unfaithful. And so in the law, there must be some kind of justice given. And this is in that context. There is retribution. There is justice and judgment coming because of all the pain and the brokenness that comes. Um, and yet I read this and I can't help but jump in my mind to how this could be abused, this law abused by husbands. And yet, it is necessary. It's given by God for a reason. That's not to say that it can't be twisted like all the things God gives. Anyway, a whole lot more could be said, I'm sure. If you've got any thoughts on it, or if you just really struggle with it, let me know, <laughs> and you can struggle along with me. All right, let's keep reading. Chapter 6. I love this chapter. <laughs> this chapter. Totally. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under their Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins. During the entire period of the Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Throughout the period of their dedication, they are consecrated to the Lord. If someone dies suddenly in the Nazarite's presence, thus defiling the hair that symbolize their, symbolizes their dedication, they must shave their head on the seventh day, the day of their cleansing. And on the eighth day, they must bring two doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest is to offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to make atonement for the Nazarite because they sinned by being in the presence of the dead body. That same day they are to consecrate their head again. They must rededicate themselves to the Lord for the same period of dedication and must bring a year old male lamb as a guilt offering. The previous days do not count because they became defiled during their period of dedication. Now this is... The law of the Nazarite when the period of their dedication is over. They are to be brought to the entrance to the tent of meeting. 
There they are to present their offerings to the Lord, a year old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year old ewe lamb without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a fellowship offering, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and a basket of bread made with finest flour and without yeast, thick loaves with olive oil mixed in and thin loaves brushed with olive oil. The priest is to present all these before the Lord and make the sin offering and the burnt offering. He is to present the basket of unleavened bread and is to sacrifice the ram as a fellowship offering to the Lord together with its grain offering and drink offering. Then at the entrance to the tent of meeting, the Nazarites must shave off the hair that symbolizes their dedication. They are to take the hair and put it in the fire that is under the sacrifice of the fellowship offering. After the Nazarite has shaved off the hair that symbolizes their de dedication, the priest is to place in their hands a boiled shoulder of the ram and one thick loaf and one thin loaf from the basket, both made without yeast. The priest shall then wave these before the Lord as a wave offering. They are holy and belong to the priest together with the breast that was waved and the thigh that was presented. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who vows offerings to the Lord in accordance with their dedication, in addition to whatever else they can afford. They must fulfil the vows they have made according to the law of the Nazarite. So, Samson, the judge, in the time of the judges, once they've entered into the promised land, he was meant to be a Nazarite. He wasn't meant to, well, not even his mum. Uh, well, I mean, it's good, isn't it, not to drink wine or alcoholic drinks when you're pregnant. But uh, Samson's mother was explicitly told not to drink wine for the reason that her son, Samson, was to be specially devoted, dedicated to the Lord. He was a Nazarite. And he let his hair grow long, but <laughs> he was rubbish at it. <laughs> he was rubbish. But it's, it is a brilliant story. It is a great story. And, um, yeah, you can check that out. I'm not going to read it now. But I often ponder this passage and wonder how Jesus fulfills the Nazarite vow. There's a throwaway line which says, and it, um, the Messiah was to be called a Nazarene, but that's not what this refers to. It's a different word entirely. Uh, we assume that Jesus had his hair cut, so that wasn't mentioned. He certainly drank wine, he turned water into wine as his first sign at the wedding in Cana. So how does this apply to Jesus? And I wonder, I don't have, I don't speak with great authority on this, but I wonder whether Jesus is fulfilling this part of the law now. Not before he uh, came and lived the perfect life on our behalf as our king, as our representative, and died our death on our behalf as our king and representative. After he's risen from the dead, after he's ascended and seated on the highest throne in heaven, I think this is when he is fulfilling the Nazarite vow. Because what did he say the night before he was betrayed and well the night he was betrayed and the day before he was crucified he drank wine and he said that he's not going to drink wine until he comes again the power of his kingdom and i wonder and there's some other little details as well about how hair represents the glory of a person here, it clearly represents the, the life of a person, kind of measures out their life. And that's why at the end of the vow, the person would shave it all off and burn it in the fire to show that all that part of their life was specially consecrated to the Lord. But now Jesus, his glory. It's interesting, it's, it's First Corinthians, isn't it? In the kind of weird teaching there the connection between hair and glory. And then there's this 
aspect as well in the Nazarite vow of how they are not to go near a dead body. And of course, Jesus in his ascension has filled all things. But physically, his glorified human body is in, in glory, in heaven. And that will be the case until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. I don't know. Maybe someone has got something better at how Jesus fulfills it. Let me know. Right, rant over. Get this, another brilliant bit. Verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites. And I will bless them. Oh, that's what it means to be part of God's people. It's to bear the name of the Lord. And that's what it means not to bear, not to take the Lord's name in vain. It's to do with all of life is because we carry his name. We bear it and this is obviously brilliant but notice as well how the threefold blessing shows the different roles that the triune God the three persons who are the living God have the Lord bless you and keep you who is the fount of blessing, the giver of life, the one who watches over us and keeps us. May the Father bless you. May he keep you. And the Lord make his face shine on you. Who is the face of God? Who is it that, uh, that Jacob, who would be given the name Israel, saw and said, I have seen the face of God Penuel, it's Jesus, the one who brings grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and then the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Lord turn his face to you, toward you, that fellowship and give you peace, the comforter. It's amazing, isn't it? What precious words. Chapter 7, verse 1. When Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed and consecrated it and all its furnishings. He also anointed and consecrated the altar and all its utensils. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of the families who were the tribal leaders in charge of those who had counted, made offerings. They brought as their gifts before the Lord six covered carts of twelve oxen, an ox from each leader and a cart from every two. These they presented before the tabernacle. A cart from every two. Covered carts, 12 oxen, and an ox from each leader, and a cart from every two. Okay, okay, I thought there was something in there. I'll keep reading, sorry. The Lord said to Moses, accept these from them that they may be used in the work at the tent of meeting. Give them to the Levites as each man's work requires. So Moses took the carts and oxen and gave them to the Levites. He gave two carts and four oxen to the Gershonites as their work required. And he gave four carts and eight oxen to the Merarites as their work required. They were all under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. But... Moses did not give any to the Kohathites because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. Do you remember that episode when 
the Ark of the Covenant was uh, taken into battle and it was plundered by the Philistines. It was in the it was put in the temple of Dagon, the Philistine god. Uh, but then the Lord himself, he doesn't need us to stand up for him. He's the living God. He's fierce. He's a consuming fire. And there, the symbol of his presence, it was the point of judgment for the Philistines. And the Philistines wanted rid of it. So they sent it back. They sent it back and they... It was used cows, wasn't it? It was these mooing cows going. But there was another time when uh, someone, whilst it was being carted along, it shouldn't have been carted along, someone reached out his hand and tried to hold up this Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God, the throne of King Jesus. And there is something deep there about us trying to prop God up. It's all backwards. He sustains all of life. We depend on him. We mustn't get that wrong and think it's the other way around. Anyway, I'm sure we'll get there eventually and we can talk to that. But remember, this is where it comes from. The Kohathites were to carry it on their shoulders they weren't given oxen or carts to carry it. They were to carry it themselves. Where did we get up to? Verse 10. When the altar was anointed, the leaders brought their offerings for its dedication and presented them before the altar. For the Lord had said to Moses, each day one leader is to bring his offering for the dedication of the altar. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nashon, son of Amminadab of the tribe of Judah. Just to warn you, there's going to be a lot of repetition here. But whenever it's repeated, we ought to think, okay, this is really important. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing ten, ten shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Nashon, son of Aminadab. And then Nathanel, son of Zua, feels really awkward because he brings the same gifts. On the second day, Nathanael, son of Zuar, the leader of Issachar, brought his offering. The offering he brought was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Nathanel, son of Zua. And then on the third day, Eliab, son of Helon, feels really, really awkward because he's gone and brought exactly the same gifts as the first two. <laughs> oh, there's something in it, isn't it? Maybe talking about the equality going on here. No one had a, a greater stake in it. There's no favoritism, both in the giving and receiving. They all had their yeah, their part. So let's read what Eliab, son of Helon, the leader of the people of Zebulon, brought for his offering, verse 25. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering. 
and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Eliab, son of Helon. Then, of course, on the fourth day, you know what's going to come. Can you say it along with me? <laughs> Have you learnt it yet? On the fourth day, Eliezer, son of Shedir, the leader of the people of Reuben, brought his offering. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering, one gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Eliezer, son of Shadir. On the fifth day, Shalumiel, son of Zerudashadai, the leader of the people of Simeon, brought his offering. Also, before we say the same thing yet again, could it be that these are needed for each of the tribes. So, in ministering to the tribe of Simeon, this plate is going to be used. This sprinkling bowl is going to be used. Could it be that this has a practical use as well as a symbolic, as as well as symbolising that they are all having an equal share in the work and the, the gifts and dedication of the tent of meeting. Right, let's read what Shalumiel brings. This is the fifth day. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering, one gold dish weighing ten shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb, a year old for burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Shalumiel, son of Zerishadai. Okay, let's talk a little, <laughs> just to give a little. Can Have you learned it yet? <laughs> Do you know what's going to come next? Maybe I should have a quiz. That'd be good. How heavy was the silver plate? 130 shekels. How heavy was the silver sprinkling bowl? 70 shekels. How many gold dishes were there? One. Uh, let, so let's look at these different sacrifices given. One young bull and one ram and one male lamb hold for a burnt offering. So there's three all together. Bull, ram, and lamb. And then there's just one goat for a sin offering but then when it's the fellowship offering there's all this abundance so there's two oxen and then five 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 maybe there's something in that let me know your thoughts i'm just <laughs> putting off reading it again aren't i we've only got we haven't even got halfway okay on the sixth day Eliasaph, son of Deuel, the leader of the people of Gad, brought his offering. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with, the, filled with incense. One young bull, one ram, and one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Eliasaph, son of Deuel. 
On the seventh day, Elishama, son of Amihud, the leader of the people of Ephraim, brought his offering. You know what it's going to be. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense. One young bull, one ram, one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs, a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Elishama, son of Amihud. On the eighth day, Gamaliel, son of Padazah, the leader of the people of Manasseh, brought his offering. <clears throat> I mean, w with this as well, <laughs> I'm just procrastinating because I've read it seven times already. In that they are all the same, they all have their equal part to, to give, there is an accountability there, isn't it? It would be really awkward if Gamaliel had a lighter dish than the others. It would stand out, wouldn't it? There is an accountability going on. Maybe there's something to chew on. Right, the eighth day, Gamaliel, son of Padazah. It's the people of Manasseh. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense. One young bull, one ram and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Gamaliel, son of Padaza. And these are all happening on different days, of course, as well. Maybe there's something in how intentional this is, how it's, the, how it's their opportunity to give what they have to the Lord and for his work. It's recognised, it's seen, and it's written down, it's known. It's not just bundled together with everything else. It's not like the Lord is some fat king whilst people just chuck hordes in front of him and he just kind of has no acknowledgement whatsoever. This is all written down for us to read now. There is such kind of respect given and even kind of honour, honouring what was given and sacrificed for the dedication of the temple of, uh, sorry, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And maybe that's an application for all this for us. To so know that everything that we give to God, his work, the dedication of his temple, which in the New Testament applies to his people, the church, the body of Christ, everything is known. It's not just kind of ungratefully waved by, lumped in with the rest, unacknowledged. It is seen and it is cherished and it's remembered. Does that encourage you as you read this? I need some encouragement to read verse 60 and onward. <laughs> On the ninth day, Abidan, son of Gideonai, the leader of the people of Benjamin, brought his offering. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing ten shekels, filled with incense. One young bull, one ram, and one male, one male lamb, a year old, for a burnt offering. One male goat for a sin offering. And two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Abidan, son of Gideonai. Even if you happen to give exactly the same as someone else, you are uniquely recognised. 
On the tenth day, Ahiezer, son of Amishadai, the leader of the people of Dan, brought his offering. His offering was, you tell me. <laughs> his offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats and five male lambs, a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Ahiezer, son of Amishadai. I'm getting the 12 days of Christmas vibes going on in my head. <laughs> I don't know whether you got that. And a partridge in a pear tree. <clears throat> Someone please set this to that tune. On the 11th day of Christmas. Sorry, I shouldn't joke about it. On the 11th day... Pagiel, son of Okran, the leader of the people of Asher, brought his offering. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering, one gold dish weighing 10 shekels, filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Pagiel, son of Okran. On the twelfth day, Ahira, son of Enan, the leader of the people of Natali, brought his offering. Say it with me. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel, each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering, one gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs, a year old, to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Ahira, son of Enan. Don't think we're done yet. <laughs> Don't sigh just yet, because we need to add up everything that was given, don't we? These were the offerings of the Israelite leaders for the dedication of the altar when it was anointed. Twelve silver plates, twelve silver sprinkling bowls and twelve gold dishes. Each silver plate weighed 130 shekels and each sprinkling bowl 70 shekels. Altogether the silver dishes weighed 2,400 shekels according to the sanctuary shekel. The twelve Gold dishes filled with incense weighed 10 shekels each, according to the sanctuary shekel. Altogether, the gold dishes weighed 120 shekels. The total number of animals for the burnt offering came to 12 young bulls, 12 rams and 12 male lambs a year old, together with their grain offering. 12 male goats were used for sin offering, for the sin offering. The total number of animals for the sacrifice of the fellowship offering came to 24 oxen, 60 rams, 60 male goats and 60 male lambs a year old. These were the offerings for the dedication of the altar after it was anointed. When Moses entered the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from between the cherubim above the atonement cover of, on the Ark of the Covenant Law. In this way, the Lord spoke to him. So yes, this is anointing, which shows something is set apart and dedicated to the Lord. Man, this video is going on. We're not going to read chapter 8. So... Presumably, here are the sacrifices for the altar, 
for each tribe in their turn and all the utensils specifically used for each of the 12 tribes and everyone has a part to play in it. Right, thank you for joining me. Well done if you stuck with me through all of that. I am very impressed. <laughs> God bless you. Bye now.